Welcome, welcome, welcome. I am Ancilla and I will be your moderator today at the creativity and social impact stage. If you feel like you want to get some creative ideas and uh, learn a few things about how you can make a social impact on society, come a little closer, catch a nice chair, and uh, come and learn something. Um, my first uh, introducing speaker today is Amy Sterling, a renowned neuroscientist from Cambridge University. And she's working on 3D puzzles where she asks gamers from all around the world to play this game by which she can map how the brain actually works. So please give it up for the one, the only, Amy Sterling. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Awesome. Hey guys, I'm excited to be here with you today. So, you know, you guys have probably heard a lot of interesting talks and great ideas across the stages at Campus Party thus far, you know, from 3D printing your own figurines to the future of journalism. It's, it's worth taking a moment to just think about, you know, where all those ideas come from, right? It's, they're all from the brain. It's obvious, but I think it's interesting to just take a moment and contemplate, you know, how our thoughts and our feelings our perception of the world and our personality that we inject out in it all comes from this little cantaloupe-sized organ behind our eyes. You know, the brain allows us to imagine, to dream fantastic dreams and create things that would never exist in reality. It allows us to, you know, enjoy cute things and it fuels humanity's ever-growing obsession with cats. It also allows us to meticulously plan out and orchestrate experiments. No matter how crazy they may seem. And you know some of the things that humanity does frankly kind of make you wonder like how it is that we have survived to now. But when you really think about it, of course, the brain is nothing short of extraordinary. You know, we can image atoms and there's a freaking permanent colony of us living up in space. I mean, there's a football stadium-sized space station, and there's a live stream that like anybody can just go and watch. Our brain allows us to both contemplate our place in this world and also understand our place kind of on the world as, it's, as a whole. You know, you guys probably took Ubers here or you biked because, you know, this, this is Amsterdam. It's easy to forget that that stuff is really new. Like, take this map from 500 years ago, right? 500 years ago is a long time, I know, but in the course of evolution of humanity, that's like less than a blink of an eye. It has coastlines and mountain ranges and rivers and also monsters. Like, look at this guy. This is like a pinstriped human faced sea creature with what looks to be a pig butt. Like, this is pretty wild. But going from, we, we rapidly went from the early stages of mythology to, to gaining accuracy and precision in our mapping. And understanding the world on which we live allows us to plan our place, to map the, the land, the sea, the air. And yeah, this is for you know, World War II mapping fire, but we also, by, by understanding our world, are able to understand the elements on top of it, within it. So this is a picture of Carla. It's a hurricane. It's a radar image from 1961, and it was the first hurricane radar that was ever shown on national TV in the United States. It may seem in insignificant now, but at the time it caused what was the largest storm evacuation of all time. 350,000 people fled their homes in Galveston, Texas because they saw what was coming, right? It's come a long way, obviously. You don't even really need to ask the weather because people are gonna tell you about it, but you can just ask your phone and you're probably gonna get push notifications if anything dangerous is coming. The point is, is that understanding first from a fundamental level, the space in which we're working allows you to innovate on top of it, right? Once you have an accurate map of the boundaries of land on the planet, then you can plan your routes. You can, once you understand the weather on our world, you can plan transportation. You can layer complexity and it affords us a manner of understanding, a manner of risk aversion, a manner of planning our world that has never before been possible. Now this is plane flights. 
each one of these little clips is just from a few hours, and all of these flights happened on one day. And this is just air traffic, right? It doesn't even show ships or cars or trains or anything else that's moving around the world. But think about it, from flat, static 2D maps, we can now visualize and plan all these layers of human society at a global level. Now, I'm making this point because this closely parallels, like this is the world of the Earth. But you can also map a different world, and that's the world of the mind. It looks very different, but also not that different. Those orange cables that you're seeing, those are fibers, they're highways of connectivity within the brain. So much like you have ocean cables, fiber optic cables that have lots of little bitty wires. The brain has these highways where different regions of the brain are connected through these pathways, these bundles of millions of axons, which are the electrical cables of the brain. And the little sparkling things that you're seeing on the outside of the brain, those are populations of cells that are firing at different frequencies. Now, at this resolution, you see millions of cells. And it, it's interesting to think, you know, you say looking at the trajectory of planes on the planet, it might give you a sense of where people are moving, but it doesn't really give you a sense of the conversations that are happening at conferences or in boardrooms, the conversations that catalyze the economies that eventually call for those flights. That's the level of the brain that we're looking at right here. If you really want to understand what's happening in the brain, you have to look closer, like thousands of times closer to individual cells. So those branches, those highways of neurons, when they reach their destination, they branch out into an arbor where there are lots of different synaptic connections between the different cells. Now, a synapse is kind of a junction where electrical and chemical activity flow from one cell to the next, and it forms circuits. I mean, you might even think of it as, you know, as these electrical impulses are flowing through these circuits of cells, they're forming like the words that eventually form sentences that eventually form paragraphs and stories, and that is how perception is built from the synaptic level up to the whole brain. But this level of the brain is mostly unknown. It's mostly uncharted because at this level, at the nanoscale that we need to zoom to in order to see synapses, you need, <laughs> neuroscience doesn't really look so much like these beautiful visualizations. It looks like big data. We're kind of in a catch-22 in the modern era of science, right? We can look closer, faster. We have incredible new imaging tools. What we don't have are any, are really adequate software to analyze the data sets that come out of those tools. So my group started actually at, at MIT, at a computational neuroscience lab, where we built software to try to map out neurons at this resolution. Now, these are anatomically accurate reconstructions of cells. You can actually see the surface topology, and because of that, you can map out where there are connections between the cells. So we build, we use machine learning, deep learning, to train computers to try to map out those cells. And before I talk any more about that, I just want to say I know this is, you know, it's scary sometimes to hear AI and neuroscience in the same sentence, but just, just a reminder of, like, of where we are. Seems like by Hollywood, like, we're so good, we're doing so well, but then in the real world, <laughs> AI is, <laughs> is not quite where you expect. And also, the kind of AI that we're building, it's not really intelligent by human metrics. It's more of a savant. It's sort of okay at doing one thing, and that thing is trying to map out little tiny pieces of neurons within little tiny volumes of brain. Tesla Motors put this adequately, I think. So they said that building a machine learning system to be 99% correct is relatively easy, but getting it to be 99.999% is vastly more difficult. And that 99.99999%, that's where AI ultimately needs to be. Now, this illustrates the principal problem in big data. You build software to parse through most of it, but a 1% error in a huge data set amounts to a tremendous amount of human expert time that's required to fix that error. In the case of neuroscience, it just basically means there's all these data sets that aren't analyzed or that researchers will pick just tiny little fractions because they don't have the time. So on one hand, we are working to build better software to you know, more rapidly 
analyze this image data. And I should also say that you know this 99% correct is easy. Like maybe for self-driving cars that's easy, but it's definitely not easy for neuroscience. Ours is like pushing 90% correct, and that is really really good. Um, so all this kind of got us thinking, like where we are right now with, with the AI, the best software in the world, which we helped build. It takes us dozens of hours to map one neuron. That's ridiculous, it's absurd, right? There's 80 billion neurons in just one brain and you can't map just one brain. So what our bottleneck is, is time. You know, we were wondering where can we find people who could you know help us like there's not enough neuroscientists in the world to help us figure this out and so we kind of drew our inspiration from games from puzzle games because actually the process of analyzing our data is quite like fitting these little 3d puzzle pieces together and this idea of games you know gamifying things that might be tasks is not really new right people have been playing games for thousands of years like the olympics turn running into a game it's not really a game and increasingly more aspects of our lives are becoming gamified you know facebook is not a game there's not a leaderboard per se but there's a news feed you don't really get a score or do you so with all this we kind of created iwire which is quite literally a game to map the brain. It's a pilot project and it began in 2012. We weren't sure if we could make this process fun and most people were very vocal in telling us that it could not be done. However, a few years later, a quarter million people from 150 countries have signed up. We've published numerous papers and we're well on the way to building multiple other projects ranging from mapping the human brain to mobile apps to uh, an Alzheimer's project with Cornell University. So I'm just gonna show you guys a little bit of actually how the game works. So that blue thing that you're seeing in the middle, that's a neuron, and that blob is its soma, that's the cell body. Those long things are the actual branches. Uh, this is a screen recording, but you, there's chat in the bottom left, and players have pretty robust profiles that have loads of stats on their history. At any given time, there's 50 to 100 people online playing, and they do hundreds of thousands of cubes, which are the unit of play every week. So when you go to start playing, it zooms you into a cube, which is a tiny volume of neuron. That blue branch, that's a piece of a branch of a neuron. Now, what actually is happening when this player is playing is they're looking for jagged edges or flat edges because neurons are biological tissue. They don't have flat, sharp edges, they're smooth. And so you can readily just click on the, on the flat edges, which you learn to do over time, and when you click, it adds a little 3D chunk. Now that 3D chunk is what was generated by our machine learning. Instead of having to go through every slice of images of, of the image, you just now can interact purely within 3D. So when you check back over the branch, make sure that it looks like it's one smooth continuous piece and that you haven't missed anything. Click submit. This was on our beta server, but um, it cross-references what each player, what you did when you submit the cube with what other people did. And based on how your accuracy is over the past cubes, it assigns you kind of a score, a weight. Uh, and there's lots of different variances in how you do the cubes, and they are, they're tiered up in different levels. Some of them are easy, some are hard. Now, as players get better at the game, they kind of become ranked, and they start interacting not within the cubes, but within the neuron as a whole. So they become scouts and scythes, which is kind of a, a play on like the Grim Reaper, because the, the top players can go in and work together to like, slice off erroneously added branches. So in a way, we're, we're crowdsourcing neuroscience, but we're also crowdsourcing the accuracy of our crowdsourced neuroscience project from the community itself. And it kind of represents a new step for science. You know, citizen science has, has been around for you know, a decade or so, and there are a number of notable successful projects, but there are very few games. There are arguably no games that are successful on the level of triple A games. And this is kind of what we're aiming to do in the next few years. But even if you look at citizen science as a whole, you know, the word scientist didn't even exist until the 1800s. And before that, it was reserved for aristocrats and noble people who did it, you know, as a hobby in their spare time. You know, then most people who do research are spending many, many years in education. And should you choose not to do science as your profession, it's virtually impossible to participate in it in any spare capacity. But now, 
thanks to projects like iWire and you know the connectivity of our modern world, anybody, anywhere with an internet connection can help be at the forefront of neuroscience and help labs make discoveries. It's interesting when you think about it, you know, the human brain over time has evolved to try to understand and to try to shape our world and really to try to understand ourselves. Like what got me excited about neuroscience in the beginning was understanding more human things like creativity and curiosity. You know, you guys are probably entrepreneurs here, you know, what is that moment when you decide that you're going to start something new? What's going on when you've like worked really hard to get something and suddenly it clicks? So we can't answer those questions yet. But I think with these novel approaches to neuroscience, with the intersection of machine learning and the crowd and design and visualization, I'm hopeful that we will get these answers within our lifetimes. And wouldn't it be something if gamers were the secret sauce? Thank you. I guess if I have time, I could take some questions. Five minutes, okay. Yeah. I will go and bring the microphone over. Sorry about that. Sorry, question. <laughs> I was wondering, how accurate is it uh, according to the scientists, the way that uh, this is uh, decided by the users? Because I can decide, well, it looks nice to me, but what guarantee is it that it's correct indeed? Right, that's a great question. Uh, it's it's equal with our professional neuron tracers at MIT and Princeton University. Uh, and this has kind of evolved over time. So we have several layers of checks and balances. So initially, lots of people will do a cube, and only the accurate players' votes count. So unless you're good enough, you can you have to do cubes in order to like earn your vote in the game. And then when the cube has enough accurate people who have done it, it reaches what's called consensus, and then it gets flagged for review from our top level players, and then they inspect it, and if there's nothing wrong, then they give it an okay. Um, but if there is something wrong, then two of the top level players have to work together to fix it. And then we have a further level of checks, which is the game masters at IYR HQ, who just visually inspect the cells to determine that everything is complete. And we've done a number of experiments where we had tracer, we call them tracers, which are the, the paid people who just map neurons all day, every day not our players, where we compare the tracers with the gamers in iWire, and they're, they're right up next to each other. Another question in the back. I'd like to know how many gamers are involved at the moment, and how long it takes to map the brain if you do the maps. Yeah, yeah, sure. So uh, we've never actually mapped a whole mouse brain at this resolution. And in fact, just to kind of give you a sense of the scale of how difficult these challenges are, you know, there's maybe 80 to 100 billion neurons in a human brain, and they're huge. Some of these cells can have 10,000 synapses. So um, uh, a federal agency in the U.S. has just launched this five-year program. It's a $100 million effort with like 20 different universities, and we're a part of it. Uh, and the goal of it is at the end of five years to map one cubic millimeter of mouse brain. And this is, th it's, that sounds super tiny, and it is, but that contains 100,000 neurons and a billion synapses. Um, and it's, it's a much larger scale project than has ever been done. And the goal of that project, and kind of the goal of this project, is to really build automated tools. Like what we need is software to do this automatically, because then that lets us tackle larger and larger data sets. Um, but you know, that's a long road coming. And so in the meantime, we still want to make discoveries. Like we can't just wait until it's fully automated. And so this crowd is a great way to get lots and lots of people to you know, basically extend the reach of different labs. And uh, to your first question, so we have 200 and 230,000 players. So not quite a quarter million, but almost. Yeah, and they hail from 145, 150 different countries. Yeah. Any other questions? Um, if, if every cube has random generated uh, pathways, how, how can you determine that it will become a brain? Oh, so it's actually not random generated pathways. Um, I kind of truncated the talk a little bit. Um, but basically, when you go do a cube in iWire, it's going to zoom you into like, to like a piece on the branch of the neuron. And so what, what you have is each, 
the challenge in the game is to map the branch from one side of the cube to the other. And then if the majority of people map the branch to exit the cube at a certain point, then the system spawns a new cube directly adjacent to it. And the starting point from that cube is the end of the branch from the first cube, if that makes sense. So you map, the, the, there's like no empty space in the brain. It's just full of, full of, uh, of neurons. Actually, I could just show you. That's probably easier. So this slide right here. So this is kind of a cross section of brain. Right, and all these little, these gray things that you see, those are the outlines or the cell membranes of branches of neurons. And so the old way of doing it would be, basically you image through, through a volume of tissue. In one cube, there's 256 electron microscopy image slices, which is four and a half microns. It's super duper tiny. Um, but what, as you scroll through, you can actually see, you, you map like the edges of the neurons from within the cube. So you're not mapping kind of a random branch, you're actually mapping one neuron branch that has grown through the volume of tissue that you're interested in. Did, did that answer your question? Okay. <laughs> you wanna elaborate on that? Um, well, the, if, if the exit point and the entry point of a cube are randomly uh, decided, then They're, they're every not random. They're, they're actually very exact. They're the opposite of random. Okay. So you start with you, s you start with the cell body, which is like the big blob, and then you map the branches outward, and you map the branches through. The cubes are generated around the edge of the branch, so it's not like a r it's not random. Does that make sense? <laughs> Did that answer your question a little bit? You gotta go home and think about it. I don't really know anything about brain, so I guess I just have to take your word for it. No, it's okay. Come and, come and talk to me after. I'll explain it to you. Uh, you can actually talk to Amy uh, at the Speaker's Lounge. Uh, you, will you be at the Speaker's Lounge, Amy? Yeah. I hope so. Yeah, I will. <laughs> and, um, and ask all of your questions. If there's any questions that you'd like to ask uh, with, together with the audience right now, raise your hand. Don't be shy. That was it for today. All right. <laughs> Thank you so much, Thank Amy you. Sterling, for your very knowledgeable and interesting <laughs> to talk. Yeah, give her a hand. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and there's a gift for you. Uh, 